I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning. I'm Jacob Weisberg. I'm the chairman of the Slate Group. Uh, Slate is sponsoring a series with the New America Foundation called Future Tense, which is about the intersection of technology, policy, and real life. Um, this is our second Future Tense event. Um, I'm excited to see everyone here this morning. Uh, people will be watching at home versus, uh, via live webcast, which is on bo both on Slate and on the New America website. C-SPAN is also here uh, and uh, filming this for later broadcast, um, which is a good reminder that at the end of the event, when you have questions, wait for someone to bring a microphone over to you and introduce yourself before asking your question. Um, today's event is called Can You Hear Me Now?, why is your cell phone so terrible? Um, which I think pretty much captures the, uh, the problem right there. Um, I should probably begin by reminding everyone to turn off your cell phones. Um, <laughs> but I will also ask the follow-up question, which is seldom asked, which is why does your cell phone turn you off? <laughs> and uh, to, um, to handle that today, we have a terrific panel uh, composed of uh, scholars, experts from both Slate and the New America Foundation, and at least one, uh, in at least one example from both places. Uh, and to introduce them, I'm going to turn things over to our able moderator, Nick Thompson. Nick is a senior editor at Wired Magazine. He's a senior fellow here at the New America Foundation, and he is the author, most recently, of an excellent book called The Hawk and the Dove, which I commend to all of you. It's on a completely different subject. Um, Nick, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Jake. And, um, all right, so I will first introduce our three wonderful panelists. To my right here, we have Farhad Manju. He is a columnist for Slate. Before that, he was most famous writing incredible essays for Salon. He is, I believe, the person in my RSS feed who I delete the least often and who has the highest success ratio. I don't think I have ever read a story of his, and I've read hundreds, but I thought, oh, that's no good. They're all, they're all excellent. Thank so, you. Farhad. Uh, we have Sasha Meinrath, who runs the Open Technology uh, Initiative here at the New America Foundation, who knows. In fact, I have never thought of a, tech, a telecom policy issue where I've called Sasha where he did not have a fascinating answer. Um, I can guarantee you that if he ran with 100% accuracy or certainty, I can guarantee you that if he ran telecom policy in this country, it would be very different. Um, and I can guarantee you with 98% certainty that it would be better. <laughs> We can talk about the. Uh, he's also, by the way, he's also one of Ars Technica's um, uh, Men of the Year. Or people to watch. People to watch, which is, which is good. To his right, Tim Wu. Tim is a Schwartz Fellow here at the New America Foundation. He is a professor at Columbia Law School. He writes for Slate. He is most famous, perhaps, um, for coming up with the concept of network neutrality, which, as we will discuss, has been um, misused in certain ways that have created the problems we are going to talk about today. Um, or misinterpreted. Uh, we, we can discuss that later. <laughs> all right, so the topic of the panel is our cell phones. They're the devices that we carry with us all the time. Uh, they're becoming vastly more powerful. They do all sorts of things they didn't do. Yet, according to Consumer Reports, they're one of the, if not the most, irritating device to people. Um, in certain areas, like if you live in the West Coast and have certain providers, you have a 30% chance that your uh, call will drop. Um, Compared to other countries, we're doing slightly better than the Czech Republic and Spain. We're doing worse than everybody else uh, when it comes to pricing on our cell phones. Uh, so they're the devices that we have with us the most often, and they drive us the baddiest. For me, the personal tick, which every year makes my, every day, a couple of times makes my heart beat about you know, 10 beats per minute faster, is when I get the, you know, to page this person, press 5. For more options, press star. Now, no one has ever pressed five, and no one has ever pressed star for more options. That only exists to slow you down and to generate more money for the carriers. And it's a little thing, but it shows something about the market that um, frustrates me and I think frustrates a lot of people and explains why there is all this antipathy. So let's begin with uh, Farhad Manju explaining uh, consumers' bill of rights for their cell phones. Farhad. Hi. Um, right, so I live in San Francisco, and I have an iPhone, which means that I get a drop call about five times a day, um, more often sometimes, and my 3G speeds are pretty bad, and in, there are several spots around the city, if I'm driving around the city, um, where if I'm on, a phone, uh, on the phone, I know my call will get dropped right there, and so I sometimes take detours around those spots. Um, <laughs> no, it's true. And um, 
so in thinking about kind of what, how we could improve the situation for consumers, um, I came up with what I call a Bill of Rights, for, um, which consists of basically just a few first steps that would vastly, I think, improve how we shop for and how we, um, and, and, and how we use our cell phones. So the first thing that I um, want to talk about is, so last year, Verizon and AT&T, um, someone's cell phone's working. It will drop um, soon. <laughs> Someone's, so they, they had this, remember this uh, ad war during the holidays where each of them said that the other the other service was um, worse. And, um, you know, AT&T brought out chubby Luke Wilson to say that their, <laughs> their service was faster. Um, Verizon said that they had more coverage. Um, so, the, but neither of those claims are any at all useful to, to you when you're going to shop for a cell phone because you have no idea whether that cell phone, perf whether that, um, what, you know, how that service performs in your zip code for the device you're looking for. So the first thing that I think we need is better data about basically the network in your area for that device. So, um, you know, if I want to shop for an iPhone in San Francisco, um, I'd get information about the drop call rate for that phone in that area. And, um, you know, I think that that would make a huge difference in how I shop for cell phones because, first of all, I would just, uh, you know, avoid bad plans, but that would give the companies an incentive to invest in their networks and create better systems there. Um, the other thing most people don't know, but thanks to um, regulators in uh, many states now, all of the cell phone uh, providers have this 30-day grace period where you can buy a cell phone, um, try it out for 30 days, and take it back without being locked into your two-year contract. Um, this is the best way to shop for a cell phone because nobody knows. I mean, you, you have no idea how that phone's going to work in your apartment, you know, where you drive, where you travel most often, because those coverage maps don't tell you anything useful. So this is another thing that I think that it should be sort of spelled out on the contract, that you can take your cell phone back, and it's sort of a trial period for 30 days. Um, the other thing we need, the, the cell phone bills are too complicated. Um, they're, you know, seven, eight pages long, and they uh, are full of weird charges and credits, and you have no idea kind of how many minutes you're using or uh, what you're using those minutes on, how much you're paying for data, how much you're paying for taxes. Um, so, you know, there's, we, the government has kind of tackled this before. Um, credit card contracts have this, um, you know, there's this requirement that they have uh, spell out all of the terms in this little box, and it's easy to compare them. Um, so we need something like that for, for cell, phone bill, cell phone bills and cell phone contracts to kind of spell out the main terms of the contract and the bills. Um, the last thing is that um, we need the right to unlock our cell phones. So if you get um, cell phones these days, and um, this is worst on smartphones like the iPhone, it's locked to your provider. And even if you... Um, get out of your contract, you pay the early termination fee or your contract is over, you still can't unlock it easily. Hackers have been able to unlock the iPhone, for example, but you can't call and uh, you know, tell Apple or AT&T, um, I'm done with my contract, let me use my phone on another provider. Um, so that's, that should be sort of mandated. I like Those that. Are the four points. Can we add a fifth that you get a rebate for every call that is dropped? Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Um, all right, speaking of unlocked phones, I'm sure that Sasha has several in his pocket right now. Um, one of the big issues for a lot of people is... That's true, actually. <laughs> we were just talking about that. Oh, really? Yeah, that's, a... that's great. Uh, one of the big issues for a lot of people is, I don't know what the word is, is it a quadopoly? I mean, there are only four companies, so um, uh, you know, there's AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint. There's some small startups, but it's really just four. And Sasha um, knows how to make it a more competitive market. Will you explain how? Sure, well... In my mind, we can look to what works best in other places around the globe and realize that they have much better, more thriving markets than we have in the United States for cellular coverage. They have lower prices. They have faster speeds. Japan wants to go to a mobile. And this is actually in the National Broadband Plan here in the United States. There's a tiny little footnote that just happens to mention that in Japan, they're going for mobile 100 megabit per second speeds by 2015. That's stunning, given that we are trying to get to four megabits by one megabit speeds by 2020 here in the United States. And it just shows how far behind we are and how much further behind we're going to fall. I also hear a lot about 
uh, people saying that they want the government out of telecommunications policy and to leave it to the market. And for all of those people, I would just say that I would like our government mandated and regulated spectrum back because that underlies and undergirds all of these telecommunications systems. In my mind, it's really about an interplay that happens between the government and markets. And what we found is internationally, places where there has been more active interplay between government mandates and setting parameters and free markets, that we've had far better outcomes for consumers in those countries. So here's a couple things that I think, you know, if I were, to, if I were a czar, that I would certainly be looking into. The unbundling of services, it pains me that I can buy a data-only plan for this laptop, but I can't buy a data-only plan in the form factor of my cell phone. And it makes no sense, right? If they're going to sell me a data-only plan for $30 a month here, why do I have to buy a voice plan and a text plan and a data plan for my, for my cell phone? There's no reason for it, and yet that is the reality here today. Try to buy a cell phone that's just a data-only plan. You will have a hell of a time. Uh, we also need wireless Carter phone. You know, we fought a huge battle. I'm sure Tim will go into this a bit more. Uh, no. <laughs> we fought a huge battle in the wireline services that ended in, you know, 1968 ruling that said, no, actually you can attach other devices to the edges of your network. This is literally what made the computer modem legal and what led, in many ways, to the development of the Internet that we know today. This same battle may have to be fought in the wireless realm because people say, well, wireless is completely different than wireline services. Now, what we know is this has been hyper-successful. Carter Phone has been hyper-successful in the United States for telecommunications using the same functions on our wireline services that we have on our wireless services. So why wouldn't we take what we already know works and apply it in the wireless realm? Likewise, we all know that cell phone usage is going up, and we all know that we need more and better spectrum to support these services. What we don't need is more spectrum for the exact same companies that have already been warehousing spectrum all across the country. We need a competitive marketplace. We need more providers. And we need more business models, and we need different ways to think about how to do this kind of service provision. Because the AT&Ts of the world don't serve Indian country in the United States. And they don't provide cheap services for low-income folks. And that needs to change. I will wrap up by simply saying that, you know, when we end exclusivity, when we end the lock-ins that we're seeing, right, to a specific provider or a specific uh, device, or specific functions and services and applications. Uh, when we do things like infrastructure sharing, you know, that bastion of like Kami pinko the economist recently came out with a report showing that sharing of towers in places like India is what has driven down the average return per user. It has driven down pricing and dr driven up penetration of cellular infrastructure. That would work here but it won't happen without government intervention. I'll stop there and turn it over. Hey, Sasha, can you give us a metaphor to help us understand the spectrum issue? Let's say that the spectrum allocated to the incumbent carriers is, say, the length of this room. How long would the spectrum allocated for experimental use into the public be? Wow. So if you look at unlicensed versus licensed yeah. spectrum, you know, if, we were, if this room length you know, 100 feet, 200 feet here where all of the spectrum, that for unlicensed would probably reach maybe to the edge of my table. And in the new broadband plan, how much is precisely is dedicated specifically to the new broadband plan just released by the FCC? How much is dedicated to unlicensed use? That's a very good question. So the new broadband plan says that they're going to repurpose 500 megahertz of spectrum, uh, but by 2015 only 300 megahertz will be reprovisioned, and that will be for flexible use mobile which sounds like it could be unlicensed, but as far as I can tell is because all flexible use mobile seems to be licensed before, will probably be licensed moving forward. So what this means is that there will be an addition to the room for right. licensed We will move the holders, back wall, but we will not extend the table. And I will still be stuck with the length <laughs> of this table. All right, Tim, you are um, considerably less concerned uh, with the quadopoly. Is that a fair statement? Uh, in well, the market right now, and you have less interest in 
breaking it up, expanding more players than some other people? Well, no, I was I was gonna make a slightly slightly right. different point. Maybe right. I misinformed you in our. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I was gonna. Well, you know, we ha- we don't have the the carriers on the on this panel. I guess uh, it might become a. It would be might become uncivil if that happened. And but I was trying to imagine. Imagine uh, you know they were listening to Sasha and the, the, the four the four carriers were sort of in a meeting, and a very honest meeting, not not a public, but a, you know what are our real interests? You can imagine a table, um, sort of a kiddie table for T-Mobile and Sprint, and a, <laughs> two giant thrones for <laughs> Verizon and AT and T. The ruling, and they say, you know what really is the solution to this problem? And if there are no, no government regulation, no, just like what honestly is the solution to this problem? They'd say, we obviously should all merge and become one company. It's time to bring back the natural monopoly, would be the, the logic. I, I'm not advocating this. I'm telling you that there are many reasons why, in the, from the perspective of, of the industry, this would make a lot of sense. And even to some extent from the perspective of consumers, which is what makes it slightly dangerous. Um, we have coverage problems. We, we talked about that before. Well, imagine combining all of the towers, all of the coverage of all the four carriers. You would actually have a far better service than maybe any other country on earth if you put all of the carriers together and you could have all their towers. Um, they could gar- begin using this sort of monopoly control to guarantee a level of reliability reason number two, that, that you don't have in, in existing things. If they're all one company and they want to sort of deploy even more coverage to other things, there's full freedom to raise prices to what you might need to raise prices to. You could uh, raise prices on long distance to, to cover local coverage, to cover Indian reservations, whatever you wanted, whatever policy. With a single monopoly, you could achieve a national policy very easily. You could use these accumulated resources, the great revenue available from the monopoly, to fund research development at a level we don't do right now. You could call something, maybe call it, I don't know, the Bell System Laboratories or something. You could (laughs) create a research laboratory of of unheard of power that that puts America way ahead of the rest of the world in terms of our our, uh, research on protocols. Finally, you could get rid of some of the threats to revenue, things like Skype, Google Android, some of these other annoyances could very easily uh, be, be gotten rid of in a consolidated system. And so if the carriers are completely honest about where their interests lie, it lies in natural monopoly. I don't think there's, there's any question. That, you know, I, Carriers will, will say very often that there's a, well, you know, we like competition, competition's American. But the truth is that for most of phone history it has been a monopoly and there's a lot of reasons it's been a monopoly because the economics all tend to point in that direction. So I think that's a very important background to understanding what we're talking about here. We have this sort of discussion of you know competition and so forth but the gravitational pull, the sort of tractor beam in the world of telephony is towards greater consolidation and towards monopoly. And as I've said before there are some serious advantages even for consumers, of a, we would all have a lot better service coverage with Monopoly. The only problem is we'd have no real way to complain about prices and we'd have uh, a lot of innovation squashed. But I want to make that very clear that that force under, under, uh, is, is under this entire discussion. And so why wouldn't the best situation be to have a regulated Monopoly where we allow this wonderful Monopoly with all these great towers and we just say... You have to allow Skype. You have to allow Android. Your profits are capped at the way AT&T's profits used to be capped. You have to take all the rest of the money, put it back into R&D. <laughs> Why not do that? Uh, that was federal policy from 1921 until 1984. And for decades, people thought that was the best of all possible solutions. By the way, I have a name for that monopoly I described. I think we would call it the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. I think that's <laughs> <laughs> A nice name. I, I don't know why. It just seems kind of a suitable. It has a certain ring to it. Um, maybe the, na- great, the National Bell Company. That was the other name for Bell early on. Um, well, you know, as I said, that was, national, that was federal policy from 1921, 1984, and, and for exactly the reasons everyone suggested. You could uh, get the best out of Monopoly. So what were the downsides? Uh, 
The downside was that you had a system. If you believe in Joseph Schumpeter, you believe that economic growth and, economic and innovation are the same thing. And the problem with the Bell system was that innovation only happened if Bell wanted it to happen. And I think we are approaching that danger in the cell phone world if there's too much carrier power, which is even in a regulated monopoly, ultimately it will be a very small group of people who decide what the innovations are, period, what can happen in the future. We saw this in, in, with the, the original AT&T. When they broke up AT&T, things went crazy in terms of innovation, and uh, suddenly it was as if there had been a dam that had been holding up you know, 20 years of developments, 30 years or 40 years of development, suddenly burst, and suddenly you had cheap long distance, you had fiber optic long distance, you had, uh, you had online systems, eventually you had the internet. All that came right after the AT&T breakup. There was this explosion, which is very closely linked to the AT&T breakup. So the price we would pay would be, even though we wouldn't see it at first, would be the price of innovation, which ultimately is a price in terms of economic growth, and so a slowing of the entire economy. So the stakes are very large. So what we should actually do is allow the monopoly to recreate itself and then break it up. And there'll be a huge <laughs> surge in innovation and then allow it to recreate itself. Well, in my book, you know, th these things happen. I, the, the, this book that you, oh, I, oh, you didn't mention, the, I, I have a new book uh, coming out in November. The Master Switch. Thank you. And the, uh, the thesis is we do go through these periods of long stretches of, 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 or actually relatively, we have long stretches of monopoly consolidated industries. And then you have a, a period of disruption, open industry, things blowing up. We may be headed towards another period of consolidation. What I'm saying is all of the economic forces point in that direction. We, you know, we talk about how great competition was. The truth is most of American communications policy is a story of monopoly. It has been that way for hundreds of years, and we are living in an exception. We can keep it that way, but the truth is we may be going back to the way things have always been. Wow. All right. I'm going to go back to Farhad for a second, and I want to actually um, blame you with the problems and not credit you with the solutions. Okay. Um, you know, all this heat has come onto the telecom companies, and particularly onto AT&T. You know, hashtag AT&T fail is one of the <laughs> biggest hashtags on Twitter. But is it really AT&T's fault? Isn't it the fault of all you darn iPhone users? Because the amount of information sucked down by iPhones over the last couple of years has grown exponentially, continues to grow exponentially, far faster than anybody can build out their network, particularly in San Francisco, where you have all the, you know, not-in-my-backyard problems. So the real issue isn't AT&T, it's the iPhone, right? Or it's smartphones. Right. Um, so you're right. The problem is that we have these great new devices that people are using just a lot more than we were using uh, data plans in the past. So um, I saw the, the last number I saw was that the average um, smart the average phone user, um, sort of other non iPhone smartphone user, uses something like 80 megabytes of. Uh, data of their bandwidth a month, and the average iPhone user uses something like 400. So there's a huge difference. And um, one of the reasons that people use the iPhone so much is it, it works really well. It's really easy to use your broadband plan on it. Um, but the other is that uh, there's no you – don't, you don't pay any greater price for using it more. It's $30 a month for unlimited – um, unlimited broadband on your plan. So um, what you have in places like San Francisco is that the network is, um, you know, it's it's completely clogged by people who are using the iPhone. That uh, both hurts AT and T's image because everyone thinks that AT and T sucks um, because they try to use their phone and it has all kinds of problems because the network is clogged. But AT and T insists that it's investing, you know, spending tens of billions of dollars a year um, trying to build out the network, and they are. I mean, I think they are building it out in in various places. But as soon as they sort of add more bandwidth, it just kind of gets swamped again. Um, so I advocated this kind of unpopular policy, at least with Slate readers, um, to uh, to impose tiered pricing on the iPhone. So instead of thirty dollars a month, you would pay you know ten, twenty, thirty, forty, whatever per um, for. I, I think my plan was ten dollars per. Um, I don't remember the exact uh, figure I used. Perhaps a hundred megabytes or something like that. Um, so the the more you use, the uh, the the more you pay. Um, I think I advocated a cap on the total monthly price of like fifty dollars uh, for your data plan, so that you couldn't 
um, you know, you wouldn't the, – the thing that people hate about um, tiered pricing and about uh, minutes, uh, you know, watching their – about watching their minutes also on their phone is that without their knowledge, they're su- they've suddenly spent $1,000 or something like that. Um, so there would be a cap. I think that would kind of make it – ameliorate some of the worst problems with tiered pricing. But I think that that's probably what we need at least until we get a good enough broadband system that, uh, you know, everyone can use it um, without face it, without having troubles. I'd like to push back on that yes. a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I will say also that wired raiders hated that idea too. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, all, yeah. all readers. But but it's it's more of a, a variant on the on the same theme. Like I would be ha- I use consistently about three gigs of data a month on my cell phone. Uh, what are you doing? Tether- <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? I'm tethering. I I am Perfect. utilizing my cell phone as a wireless access point so that when I'm on, uh, when I'm in an airport. I get free wireless because I'm using my own cell phone. And when I'm in the hotel lobby, I don't have to pay the extravagant fees that they want to charge me for like one hour worth of service. And when I'm at home, I can just open up my cell phone and plug my laptop into that or wirelessly connect to that and use it as my gateway. So you should pay more. I would be happy to pay $50 a month for an unlimited data plan if I could just buy the damn data plan. The problem is I can't. I, I get all these add-on fees, and so it ends up you know, that I'm not actually saving any money, and I'm not just using the data. I'm forced to pay quite a bit more than $50 a month for services and applications that I don't want or necessarily even need any longer. How much do you pay? About – well, officially I pay about $80 a month. <laughs> it's usually around 90 to 100 by the time all the strange fees and other things that you're talking about end up on there. But – I also want to point out the reason why our infrastructure is overloaded is because it was built incorrectly from the get-go. And there's a reason why a lot of other countries aren't having the same conundrum, even though they have devices and have actually much higher usage of their networks. And that's because they built smarter networks. They built better networks. Their businesses built better and smarter than American businesses. So to blame your users for this is a really American phenomenon. And it's strange that we take it. It's like, no, guess we do suck as users for actually using the service that you've promised me and not delivered. It's kind of like healthcare, you know? Why the hell did you get sick? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, it's a little bit of that. Exactly. What was wrong with you? <laughs> but there, there is a, a really simple way to like, boost the capacity of these networks, and that's to either build more towers or have uh, more innovative spectrum use. So we think of spectrum more like it's all full, right? Except we've run the reports. We know that 90% of spectrum in the major cities of the United States is empty. And the reason why is because we have hyper inefficient spectrum licensure. And we know, for example, that the iPhone offloads about 40% of all of its traffic to Wi Fi hotspots, to unlicensed spectrum. Like, we know that works. We know at and already done it. We know that it's part of their business model, and yet we don't actually supply the spectrum that we need to make, take advantage of something that's already been proofed out here in the United States as a solution to the congestion problem. Now, I have, as somebody that watches telecommunications policy very closely, I have no idea why it is that it's been so difficult to implement solutions that we know work. That is a good question. I, I want to say briefly on the tiered pricing issue. When I mentioned at the beginning that Tim's notion of network neutrality had been um, misappropriate to evil ends, what I meant was that um, you know, the idea of network neutrality is that the carrier should allow all bits to travel equally over their lines. So if AT&T is having a fight with Google or is competing, uh, creating a competitive service, they can't block Google. That idea has been turned by readers of my magazine and many other people into the notion that there should never be tiered pricing. So whenever tiered pricing comes out, the argument is this violates network neutrality, which is a sacrosanct principle, and then the conversation ends in, uh, ends in disaster, <laughs> um, which is, I guess we can blame Tim for. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm not against tiered pricing. I, 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 idea, I like the idea of um, that net neutrality would be a sacrosanct principle, but I, I, I don't uh, oppose tiered pricing. Yeah, I've always thought it's – I mean, it's – but I w- and I want you to, I yeah. want you to expand a little bit on what um, – actually, I want you to take what Farhad was saying a little bit different. You have some very interesting theories about, about the iPhone in particular, not uh-huh. just as the uh, device that's um, causing some of these problems or contributing to some of these problems yeah. that 
Farhad has mentioned, and Sasha explained how we could avoid, but what else do you think about this device? Yeah, you know, I, I, I somehow seem to take this 100-year view of everything, which may uh, be uh, unsatisfying to some people, but uh, I, the iPhone and the iPad, uh, many of these devices, the, the, the rise in the power of the phone against the computer, I see as this sort of long-running... Uh, hundred-year battle between more open and more closed devices, um, almost like a, you know, almost like a battle between hin two Hindu deities or something that keeps recurring in different forms. I mean, we had the same battles in the 20s uh, over, over different types of radio structures, more open radio that anyone can do versus a few networks. Uh, we had the same kind of uh, disputes as to what television should be in the 1930s. And t uh, today, in this... Um, Rise of the iPhone. I, the iPhone is an astonishing device. I, you know, I don't, I don't deny that. Uh, I had one for a while. I lost it or something, but uh, <laughs> it ran on T-Mobile. I, I, I had one for a while. It was an ama amazing device. But it's as it begins to replace the computer, and as the iPad begins to replace the computer, it is a very f and as cloud computing becomes more popular, it is a very fundamental switch in the power given to individuals. Phones and iPads are good for consuming information. They're not good for creating it. It envisions, it takes us back to a, nature, a, a nation of consumers, passive watchers, you know, maybe texters, that's a little different. The iPad is more in common with the television than it does with the computer. It's basically a screen where you watch stuff that other people have made. Um, and you sort of sit back, it's beautiful, it's, it's enjoyable, uh, the best, most talented people make stuff. It's basically the model of, of NBC, 1927. Uh, that kind of idea, or Hollywood in the 1930s, of highly centralized, specialized creators of content serve a passive consumer. It's the opposite, actually, of a vision of a company named Apple Computers in 1976, <laughs> which in designed this device called the Apple One, which was designed to put all the power in the hands of the user. And in order to use that device, it's the ultimate DIY device. You had to write your own software. You had to write your own things. You know, all the early computer applications were written by hobbyists and computer users. You had to basically do everything yourself. The iPad, you basically do nothing yourself. It's sort of astonishing they're created by the same company. It's a little bit of a, you know, it, it, it is actually the final victory of Steve Jobs over Steve Wozniak in the original partnership. Because Steve Jobs, you know, he was always the produced one. And, and, and Steve, anyway, this is a, getting too much into Apple, like, psychology. But the, the, the company that created the personal computer is now trying to destroy the personal computer. And that's what I think is the deeper significance of the iPhone and the iPad. The final triumph maybe that Steve Wozniak said he was going to have to wait in line to buy an iPad tomorrow. So, <laughs> um, Well, let's, let's, let's stay with this openness principle. So Tim has been talking about this. Sasha, you've mentioned openness a couple of areas. Cell phone towers should be shared. Spectrum yes. should be given to the people. Right. Where does the principle of openness stop? Should we just give all of at and spectrum to unlicensed use? I mean, what are, your, what are your principles for where these policies you advocate for open, openness, ex how far do they extend, and then where do they no longer extend? Sure. Well, let me, you know, let me first start by saying one of the take-home messages from the last 25 years has been that when we have interoperable networks of networks, we can do amazing things. And that that's predicated upon sort of this... Uh, notion of interoperability. It's predicated on this notion of, you know, you can transport data around these networks freely, that they're peered together, and that you don't have these artificial bottlenecks or barriers to moving information, to disseminating information, to disseminating media around. When we look at today's cellular infrastructure, it's the opposite of all of that. It's taking everything that we've known has worked really well and changing it into a command and control infrastructure. And that has profound implications for exactly what Tim is mentioning about, you know, like, are we producers or just passive consumers of media writ large? And are we, 
in control of our devices to be able to attach new things and develop new technologies and develop new hardware and new services and new applications and run them freely on these networks. It's not just that we're talking about the potential for the computer to be taken over by something that's sort of locked down. It's that what you can then do on the next generation computers may be completely different. You might not even have the choice to accidentally download a virus because everything's so locked down that you can't run anything except something that's gone through the official, you know, iPhone store or G store or what, you know, whatever those next generation stores are going to look like. Now, some would argue, you know, and I've heard this so many times, it's kind of scary, you know, there's like 200,000 iPhone applications out there and that that's like a, a, an indicator of success. And I'm then thinking like there's probably 18 trillion times more, you know, things out there for computers because they are open and because people have developed so many different elements and so many different technologies and so many different services and applications. And we're in danger of losing that. And, of course, in any sort of vibrant, lively, healthy ecosystem, you have both the really pristine, beautiful creatures, and then the ugly dung beetle of you know services and applications that are out there that are serving different constituencies and filling different niches. I worry that we lose a lot of that as we move towards this command and control infrastructure. Now, before we all sort of despair, I'd also like to point then to a potential for a utopian outcome, which, which is in essence kind of the return of do-it-yourself Technologies Like what if we could all build our own cellular infrastructure? What if we could create small networks that interconnect into these larger networks? It wouldn't be to disassemble or destroy at and It would be to supplement and complement the at and of the world. And the reality is that these technologies exist today. There's a project called OpenBTS. They've developed open hardware, open source technologies. You can today build your own cellular infrastructure that covers a fairly sizable area, a multi-mile radius area, for a few thousands of dollars. And it will work right now with the cell phones that you already have in your pocket. And it will work seamlessly with those. And it can provide free, not low cost, but free connectivity, free cellular phone coverage once it's plugged into the Internet as a whole. And this was this was proofed out. Anyone can do a, a Google search for OpenBTS and find this stuff. You can buy it today. We, the Open Technology Initiative here at New America, are going to be applying for an experimental license from the FCC in order to experiment with how this thing works and, and what it looks like and all this other stuff. The problem comes all the way back to getting the government out of telecommunications. If the government wasn't there, I could set this up immediately. I could just build my own cellular infrastructure. But of course, the government mandates that in cellular infrastructure or cellular licensure, one company has the license for a specific frequency in a specific location. So I'm actually prevented without this experimental license from setting up a technology that would be very good. Now, if you look at the underserved areas, if you actually take, you know, the Verizon and AT&T maps that they've been battling over and you overlay them, you realize that they both don't serve the same areas of the country, the rural and the poorer areas of the country. So why shouldn't we then allow these communities to build their own tele telecommunications infrastructure? Why shouldn't an Indian tribe set up its own cellular infrastructure when nobody is serving them today? These again point to changes that are viable right now with today's technology that necessitate changes at the level of the FCC and, and beyond. Well, let, let's, let's take that. So, okay, changes that are necessary at the FCC and beyond. And uh, Tim and Farhad, tell me, each of you, maybe two things that you would like to be seen done by the FCC, by the government, that would make this situation better. Either would make our coverage better, would you know, make our cell phones work better, or that could prevent us from heading into the conglomerate dystopia that um, a lot of people... Uh, fear. So, either one of you, two things you'd like uh, you'd like done. Can I get three? <laughs> I'll have. I, I, I'll mention. Uh, you three. can have you three, can, but then three, Sasha yeah. gets to refute one of them. No, he won't. He'll agree <laughs> with them. He'll agree Fire with them because down. they're more or less what he what, what he said. Uh, I, it, the FCC, if you could, um, if, it, if it's listening at this moment, um, I, you know, it, some of it they mention in the in the in the in the in the broadband report, but 
the obvious three things the FCC should do, the, the, the three things that nobody will plausibly disagree they should do, I think, unless no one for any good reason can disagree they should do, is number one, to create a big, fat, unlicensed band somewhere. Uh, you know, I'll, just one. And another one. I mean, we have, we have Wi-Fi, but one more big, unlicensed band uh, where... And see what what happens. I mean, New York has Central Park, right? I, it, there, there's a there you is all, New York has Central Park. It has streets. You always need some commons amidst the property, and the ratio, as Sasha already said, is, is out of whack. No one could disagree that if you opened up at least one big fat piece of commons, there would be a, a extraordinary consequences. The second is something Sasha mentioned too, which is wireless Carter phone. A very basic, clear principle that everyone should be able to attach whatever device they want to a wireless network. Americans are used to the idea that you can buy a telephone, wire telephone, plug it into the jack. Probably the most single, most successful FCC policy ever was the design of the telephone jack. So you didn't need to have a repairman come in to install your telephone. Anyone could buy a telephone on the open market and plug it in. We basically have the technologies to do that very easily, in, in the, and all you need is the right to attach any device to the wireless networks. That will give a company the room to, for example, build a, a camera that, oh, by the way, also uploads your, your photos to, to, to your website or... or any kind of wireless device. You know, the wireless market isn't bad, but it would be better even if anyone could attach any device. And also consumers, when they spend hundreds of dollars on a phone, would know they could keep the phone and move it from carrier to carrier if they needed to, especially if it was compatible with all the different carriers. Uh, the final, well, maybe I'll stick with those two and see what Farhad right, has Farhad. to say. No, I, I, I agree. I think those are good. I think that I, I just want to... Um, point out a couple things about what you guys said about the iPhone and the iPad. Um, I think what's dangerous about, I, I agree with you, that so, we're, so we're, we're, in this, we're in this time where um, we're going back toward these sort of more closed devices that are kind of antithetical to what the, the PC movement was about. Um, the problem is that people like these devices, and they like them, I think, more than they like PCs. Part of the reason is that they do less, and they do less, and because they do less, they're easier to use, and um, you know there are a billion things you can do on the web, but I think people are satisfied with the 200,000 things you can do in the App Store. Um, I think that there are some people, people like me and you guys, who bemoan that, but I think one of the – I mean, that's, that sort of points to the danger is that um, these devices could get really popular. Um, they are really popular, and the, I think the iPad's going to be pretty popular too. Um, the the other thing that um, so I think though that there are sort of not we we shouldn't sort of think that this is over um, that there's sort of that this is going to be the state of things um, for one thing I think that we'll have openness through the web which will sort of live on all of these devices um, I don't think app stores are going to be kind of the way we get our apps in the future um, I mean it seems it seems extremely likely that developers who want to create, create applications for all devices. And so if you create a website, a web application, it'll work on all, uh, all devices. So I think that'll be sort of the, the feature. And um, the other thing I think is that we have this new kind of lobbying force um, in Google and other internet companies that want the kind of future that you want um, and could sort of push back against some of the telecom policies. We've seen some small victories by these internet companies, um, probably not to the degree that you would like, but I think that um, there is sort of a powerful and better force out there. So yeah, to avoid a one giant monopoly taking everything over, we need to rely on the good wills of another giant monopoly. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, but, but they're not monopolies. I mean, well, I mean, Google is perhaps, but they're, they're sort of, you know, uh, powerful companies um, I acting in, in different parts of the, the web industry. No, the Google-Apple rivalry is really interesting and very significant. It is, uh, you know, these are the ideological leaders in the tech world of our, of our time, and I, I think it's very important to watch that, uh, that develop. 
You know, I, I agree with you that people, I think the iPad and uh, will be extremely popular. The iPhone, as I said, is a magnificent uh, device, and consumers do like uh, dumb <laughs> devices that, uh, you know, television it was and is extremely popular. Right. Uh, you know, there's a there's a sort of a deeper question about what kind of country you want to live in. And I, I, I know you can't really, or what kind of world you want to live in. Uh, and we go through these strange kind of cycles, as I've said. You know, we, we knock down all these old neighborhoods and build skyscrapers, uh, tall buildings. Everyone wants, you know, those kind of, everyone decides at some point they want to live in gleaming new fancy uh, 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 housing developments. And then next thing you know, everyone regrets it and wants to move back downtown and wants the old thing. We go through these strange things of like what consumers want. And they go in these weird cycles. Um, and I guess what I, I, I think is I do think we are going to um, have a move. I, I think we're generally moving, as you said, towards a, the open age of the Internet, the last 20 years or so, I think is starting to come to a close. I, I, a lot of signs suggest that. Um, but I think we will while we love these devices uh, and love the content and, they, and they're beautiful, start to regret it at some point and look back and say, well, maybe something was lost. Sasha, you want to follow that up? Yeah, uh, and maybe push back a little bit. And I, I also I, want to say we're going to go to questions in about a couple minutes, so start thinking of them. Super. In the U.S., I feel like, you know, Obviously, we had a provocative title about how crappy our, our cell phones were. But I think most people are probably thinking, like, my cell phone's pretty good. It does a lot of neat stuff, and it's liberated me to take phone calls anywhere, which is, I guess, a, a benefit and a detriment. Except for San Francisco. Except for San Francisco. Uh, and so we think, in terms of what we know, that you know these are pretty cool devices. But I would argue that we sort of have this ignorance is bliss policy here in the United States. And I remember a couple of years ago, I was, I was at uh, David Eisenberg's Freedom to Connect, and there was a guy, a gentleman there from, from Japan. And you know, at the time, my cell phone sort of opened up, the clam phone, right? So it flips up. His flipped up, and then it, the screen rotated. And then the camera rotated. And I was like, what's going on? This thing's like a little transformer. And he's like, oh, this is, this is so that we can do live video chats on my cell phone. And I was like, what are you even talking about? Because that technology, the capacity for that technology simply did not exist anywhere in the United States. And he's like, yeah, and check this out. And he turns on his cell phone, and the top of the cell phone just says, service not available in your location. And the reality is like, yeah, it's really cool. Cell phones do a lot of neat stuff, but we have no idea how much we're missing out on. And so we declare victory and declare these things to be marvels of the modern era. Because we don't realize that, like, over there they've got, like, jet packs and flying cars. And we're still trying to figure out, like, how to get another barrel of oil out of the ground. And this is going to be more and more of the story that's told internationally. Because we are looked at as far behind the curve and falling further and further behind in terms of technological innovation, particularly in telecommunications. Yeah, I, well do you want to push back? No, on no. That? No, I, I want to. I think somewhere. I want to push. I, I don't want to. You know, I've lived overseas. I, I like other places, um, <laughs> <laughs> too, and I, I, I and, and spend a lot of time. But I also like America. I was born in Washington D.C., and I think I don't think America is behind in every aspect. I think that's much too strong, to, to be honest. I, you know, in in term, America is actually. It's going to offend the carriers a bit, but I think America is, is, is the world leader in, 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 app, in applications. I think in the applications market, th there's no country that can compare. The problem has always been that our carriers, they're not bad, but they're just not, you know, th I think that, that's more realistic. I'm just saying, I don't think in every single part of the uh, market, the Amer other companies are better. But you know. more and more. What would be your bet for our placement if we're number one today for 10 years from now? In, in applications? Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe I, I, I'm optimistic. I, I think I, it does depend. You see, if, if, the, if our networks do not get better, which is a, a problem, um, they're okay, but they need to get better. It's true. Eventually, our app providers will, will suffer as well. Yeah. All right. Well, on that um, cheerful note, let's move to... Um, <laughs> to the audience. All right. Uh, second row right here. Please, a um, couple of things. State your name, state your affiliation, and even if we can hear you speaking to the microphone so that the um, people watching on simulcast can hear you as well. 
Gabe Goldberg, freelance and technology writer. Uh, to Professor Wu's suggestion that if all of the carriers merged, they could come up with Bell Labs again, it seems that the cable companies have done cable labs without all of the carriers, all the cable companies merging. They've come up with DOCSIS 3, and there seem to be standard cable modems that can move from one carrier, one cable company to another. Why do the cell companies have to merge in order to do what the cable industry has done? Well, and, and there, is still, uh, uh, there is still Bell Labs. I, I, it's really a question for the, uh, for the industry more than, more than for me. I, I just pointed out that the, the Bell Labs... I just wanted to point out that there's a lot of things, if we just let things kind of run their course and not interfere at all with government, the natural answer, I think, would be a reestablished monopoly. That all the problem, a lot of the problems we were talking about could be solved by a single national monopoly. Um, and then we'd have to say, well, do we really want that? But I, I, I just want to point out, and, and one of the advantages of the single national, you don't have to have mergers, but it's a lot easier if you control all the pricing to sort of uh, take as much money as you want to fund. Cable Labs is not funded the way Bell Labs was. Bell Labs, um, Bell, when you think about Bell, uh, this is maybe a little off topic, but Bell Labs is an astonishing laboratory for the 20th century. And the reason was is that the Bell monopoly effectively operated like a tax on Americans, and they used all the money and funded a, a research institute. So it, it, that, those are sort of the advantages of a monopoly is you can basically tax Americans. Um, the government's not willing to tax, but instead use them at higher prices to, to create a tax and then fund research. The question is whether you, we really want that again, and that is kind of the question I'm trying to pose. Um, hands up. Yeah, right there in the back in the blue shirt behind you. Uh, neither uh, Mr. Manju nor oh, and, uh, Mr. Uh, you can say your I'm name sorry. and your affiliation. That'd be oh, great. I'm sorry. Tyrone Brown, Media Access Project. Neither Mr. Manju nor Mr. Wu uh, included tiered pricing in their top tier uh, uh, area priorities for change. Why not? And why are the carriers? Why why don't the carriers see tiered pricing? as being part of their current economic interest. Well, I just think it's, it's, it's as you um, saw here, it's a tremendously unpopular idea um, so with consumers. So I, I, it, just wouldn't, it just wouldn't work kind of as a marketing plan. Some of the um, – I, I think that there's sort of been rumors or um, companies have tried to float the idea at several points, and I – Imagine that we'll see it um, as as we get more and more smartphones, or at least not tiered pricing, but tiered speeds, so you can buy a low speed plan and a high speed plan. Um, I don't I don't consider it a sort of a priority for the long term uh, management of broadband, but I think in the short term, where we have kind of this limited bandwidth, that it would be a good thing to institute. I can just comment on that um, for the same reason as you. I don't you know. I, can advocate a limited number of things. Tiered pricing is a little hard to get excited about as a something to advocate. But um, something is going to have to give. There's a situation here. Americans have developed the are starting to develop the relationship with their cell phones, similar to to their automobiles, which is we like them big or relatively big. We like them to do a lot of stuff. We basically have sort of an insatiable appetite for bandwidth. And it's uh, growing, not going away. Uh, there's a limited resource. In other words, there's every element here of sort of an energy crisis in the bandwidth world. Uh, insatiable consumer demand. Uh, industry wants to serve that demand. Uh, limited supply. And something is going to have to give. I don't know what it's going to be, but something is going to have to give. Uh, Jim? Actually, could I just add sure. to that? I mean, yeah. the, one of the big problems we face today is if you were to have tiering with as little transparency as we have today, it's useless. In fact, it would actually be a disaster. So today what you all get is an up-to speed, for example. You get up-to speeds on your home bandwidth. You get up to X amount of text messages or minutes a month on your plan. And you're never really fully in control as to what's being used on that and how much you actually are using, and you don't get to carry over more stuff. What companies, when they talk about tiering, they talk about, you know, you will get a tier, and if you don't use all of that capacity, it goes away. It's like buying gasoline for a trip, and then, like, if you don't use it all, then 
they come and like suck it seat like suck it out of your gas tank and i think that that isn't what we're talking about when we talk about tiering we think about it in terms of you buy what you actually use and you pay only for what you actually use now that would be radically different from the proposals that i've seen thus far Jim Snyder from Isolan. I got a, a comment and a question. Nick, when you uh, asked the question about license versus unlicensed in the national broadband plan, there's a hidden assumption there that I think is quite misleading. Uh, and then you get a, a response that isn't quite accurate when you ask the question that way. And that is, there's such a thing as discrete unlicensed versus licensed ban. Now, that's often the case, but it's often not the case. Often, unlicensed is an underlay or overlay in a license ban. Even in the Wi-Fi bans, which are commonly thought of as unlicensed ban, there are significant license users. The unlicensed users coexist with them. To take a really vivid example that's not at all thought of as unlicensed, in the FM ban, which we would all think is licensed, several million Americans connect their satellite receivers to their inboard dashboard FM over an FM channel. Now, the catch is it's so low power that if you're even in the back seat, it only goes about four feet. It's an unlicensed underlay in the FM band. So actually, if you frame it that way, most spectrum allows at very low powers unlicensed use. Yes. And if you look at the national broadband plan, they talk about opportunistic unlicensed use of many licensed bands. So they don't yeah. quantify it. But that vision of coexisting unlicensed with licensed ban is very much there. And they also do have a, t a 10 megahertz commons, as, yeah, as long right. Tim suggestion there. The emphasis in that plan is where we're going to find the spectrum. And they're a little bit vaguer on uses. But they are sympathetic to significant unlicensed use. So that, just as a framing, <laughs> the question is, uh, another assumption of the panel is that it's useful to frame this as wireless policies versus wired, say, marketing transparency. Now, Tim has made a lot of, uh, been very effective in talking about wireless Carter phone versus wired, and we should have a symmetrical regime. Why not frame this issue as not mobile as different than, than other, as a common problem? The reality is, in many respects, wireless transparency is better than wired. When I call up Verizon on Fios and ask, for my the overall price with taxes, they won't give it to me. But when I call Verizon Wireless, they will actually give it to me. There are dozens of components when you buy wire, the converter step bot taxes, the DVRs, the cable modems that are not disclosed, that are often highly misleading, just as bad as in the wireless world. The coverage mm -hmm. information is awful, as New America has articulated many, many times. Knowing what your actual rate is is almost impossible. If it's wet outside and there's exposure, the line of speed might go down if there's a lot of people on at any particular time. So the problems are largely symmetric. What's the value of creating asymmetric regulations for wireless versus wired? Well, we could, if we generalize it, just look, come up with one set that applies to both type of problems. Yeah. Tim? It's a good point. Uh, the second point in particular, <laughs> that's a, it's a good point. Can I can make a comment on the, on the first point? This might get a little techy for our audience, uh, but maybe not. Uh, people enjoy this kind of stuff. No, oppor I, I completely agree with you about opp 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 opportunistic use of uh, uh, spectrum. And my techy point is what, what hasn't happened in wireless, as I see it, and some experts might disagree, is the basic, the packet, the whole idea of packet networking, essentially, hasn't really happened in the... <laughs> spectrum world. And what I mean by that is when, when you get to the very basics of what was people were thinking about in the 60s with, with uh, packet switch networks is the idea of just using any route anywhere to get from A to B as opposed to a planned, established, fixed kind of route. And, you know, basically we've been trying for the last 10 years. Uh, uh, David Reed, I think, wrote a paper in 94 or something saying we need to take these approaches and move them to wireless. The approaches we're using for internet transmission still hasn't really happened. Uh, but what you're what you're talking about is basically taking the genius of the original internet ideas. I mean, I mean Paul Baran, 1960s ideas, and moving them to wireless. And that I think, if we ever got that off the ground, would really make a huge difference. Do you, I don't, Sasha, if you agree or disagree with me. No, that that's definitely true, and it's also very much true that left to its own devices will never achieve that will end up with specific protocols that are special to the wireless realm and specific architectures that bake into the hardware certain 
you know, quality of service measures and, and bifurcations of the networks that are antithetical to the successes of the internet. Uh, but will require us to then sort of create whole new regimes for how to deal with these problems that have been manufactured. Right. I, I mean, will, yeah. I will also say, you know, this in many ways ties back to this notion of transparency and the Schumer box idea that was brought up, you know, to get things started. That consumers really do need to have access to a basic level of information before they're buying the services, and they need to be given a certain service level agreement about what it is that they're buying in the first place. Now, if that's tied to the services or tiers or whatever you want to call it that are provided, we would all be in a better situation than we are right now. But mm -hmm. you know, this really points to we, we, we're hopefully ending years of uh, enforced ignorance about what's happening on these networks. Our government has refused to investigate a lot of the problems that have been existent and known about for quite some time. And... My hope for the National Broadband Plan is that it's a space where we can actually start diving into these issues. And in my mind, this is the wireless, wireline divide that the telcos want to create, in my mind, is akin to sort of the Title II information service craziness. It's just another three-card Monty, three Monty game where they're like, no, 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 you don't need to regulate us because we're actually something different than what had existed before. And I think that technologically, functionally, it's not. It's very much the same. All right, next question. Uh, packet switch networks is a phrase banned from the next question. I'm um, sorry so about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I need a whiteboard to kind of explain that better. Third row. Hi, I'm Iris Somberg with Wilson Electronics' Can You Hear Me campaign, and we're actually advocating for the use of signal boosters and Wilson's products. They all have new technology which reduces the power of the signal as it gets closer to a tower so they don't actually interfere with the networks. But the FCC is currently reviewing a petition and the main four carriers, as you discussed, they want to keep it so they can only sell their very expensive boosters when people need help in rural areas or in buildings. And we want people to be able to go out and buy their own. And we're actually asking people to write letters to their representatives and send it to us at action at here, H-E-A-R dash me dot org. But I was wondering what your opinion is if people should be able to go out and purchase signal boosters that have technology that won't interfere with the networks and if that would help with a lot of people's cell phone issues. It absolutely will help with people's cell phone issues, particularly in areas that are least served today. And I think it's a it's a great example, in fact, of how technology has progressed to the point where we could be doing far better than we are, but refuse to enact the policies that would enable us to make use of these technologies. In my mind, it's akin to, I mean, if you remember, AT&T phones used to be hardwired into the network. You didn't have a jack that you could unplug and plug. And that was done because they were worried that, you know, if you had these other devices, these uncertified devices by the Bell Labs and what have you, that somehow that would cause harmful interference on the AT&T network. And the whole battle over Carter phone, or even before that, you had Husha phone, which is literally AT&T saying that a plastic cup connected onto your handset would cause harmful interference to their network. And as a tech-savvy individual, when I hear about the interference claims that are being made right now in the wireless space, it's just as ludicrous. And so, yes, these are technologies that absolutely must be allowed if we're going to continue to build better and better networks that are more dynamic. And until policymakers lead in this space and say, actually, engineering demonstrates that this is a ridiculous statement. LPFM will not destroy radio as we know it. And Having distributed devices in these spectrum bands won't cause harmful interference. It takes out, you know, thousand watt transmitters. Uh, until people stand up and and call a spade a spade, uh, we're going to continually have these battles where it becomes a a de facto he said she said argument. Even though you know things like reality and physics are clearly on your side. Farhad, is that right? I mean, these cell companies have spent billions of dollars on these networks. Shouldn't our default position be? their position about what will work on this network and what is good for this network and what is good for these customers. They are essentially need to pay back all the money they've spent building these networks. We should assume that their position is generally going to be the right one. Well, not if they have no proof for their position. and It's, as Sasha says, sort of contradicted by science and physics. Mm -hmm. I would disagree. Um, uh, on another point, 
on. Oh well. <laughs> well, well, well. I just want to add one. Th- there's another example of this. I get. I keep getting a call from this inventor who invented not a signal booster but a cell phone jammer um, that he thinks would be a great way to stop people texting in cars. Um, and so he says. He says his technology will only work in the driver's seat. Um, and uh, he really, really wants the FCC to approve this, and he thinks it'd be a great thing for society. But. Um, it's not legal. Wait, so I could drive I think, and turn somebody else's phone off if they're driving? No, no. You, you, could, you, could, you could only use it in your own car. So you put it in your car. It works in the driver's seat. And he says that the passengers can, can text and do whatever they want. But the person in, – in, so, like, if, if, you're, if your kid is driving, then you can um, shut off their cell phone. You know what's going to happen there, right? It's like people are now going to be texting like this. <laughs> but – no, but there, there are great examples of this kind of situation arising. White space devices, I think, is a classic one where the National Association of Broadcasters said, if you allow unlicensed devices into the television bands, it will destroy television, that these low power, m- several milliwatts, dozens of milliwatt devices will take out this 100,000 watt transmitter. They were literally arguing. And then, so we were like, well, the physics doesn't back that up, but we actually have a counterexample. There's tens of thousands of unlicensed wireless microphones like that one operating in television bands right now without destroying television. We have C-SPAN and my wireless mic coexisting happily. And yet that reality, the fact that this is right in front of us right now, doesn't seem to get through to the policymakers that need to make decisions about this. Uh, Next question. Back there on the right. Neil Chilson, Wilkinson Barker, now. Um, so rather than have this back and forth, uh, he said, she, she said, there is a, a good way that, that we've solved problems like this in the past, and that's people tend to put money behind what they think is the science backs. And uh, so rather than unlicensing spectrum and then having a bunch of people where we basically still have a centralized organization that is determining how people should use this spectrum, why don't we just make it really easy to transfer spectrum rights? And so that I could negotiate the right to use a signal booster and pay uh, Verizon or AT&T for that right. Right now under the FCC regulation, I couldn't do that. Um, And broadcasters are even, even more strictly limited to what they can do with their spectrum. So why not by expanding spectrum rights? Uh, how would that address this problem? I'd like to get your, your feedback on that. Sure. Well, in my, my mind, uh, and this is actually brought up in the National Broadband Plan where they sort of raise this issue of you know, uh, license holders getting funding when the FCC recaptures their spectrum. I think what gets forgotten in a lot of these arguments is we, all the people in this room, we, the general public, are the landlords for all spectrum. We own this spectrum. It's ours. And as a landlord, you know, if I were subletting to somebody and then I wanted to rent to somebody else, I wouldn't say, well, I know you were in my apartment beforehand, and because of that I'm going to give you a little kickback on the next renter of my apartment. And transferring spectrum rights is very similar. It's like, that money that's received should go back to the landlord. Like, we own this thing, and we should get a cut if somebody else is going to use that. And that's how it works today. You have a relationship with the FCC directly, not with whoever happens to license it before. Now, there's a move, and this is all the way back to quotes and what have you, of property rights in Spectrum, that actually it should be more like a co-op, and you buy your license and then can transfer it equitably. But... As a landlord over Spectrum, I think, like, well, wait a sec. I would make a whole lot more money <laughs> over time if I continued to be the landlord rather than selling this off of, for the short-term gain. And when I look at the United States, yes, we are often looking only at the short-term gain, but over time, keeping those Spectrum rights in the public domain and having us maintain ownership over those, I think, is clearly the most beneficial long-term monetary outcome for the people of the United States. Yeah, I, I disagree with uh, Sasha a little bit. I, I've always thought, well, you know, my, I'm, I'm into, I agree with the questioner, basically. Is I, I think would, 
I basically think some of it should be sold off and see what happens. I think I, I don't hold sacrosanct this idea that it's a public trust and so on. I mean, I, I, I yeah, maybe that's like selling the Grand Canyon. Maybe it's a <laughs> bad bad thing or something. But I, I, I don't know. You could sell a little corner and see what happens. I, I just I, I I'm interested. Like the questioner is, what would happen with pure property rights and spectrum? And I think some interesting things might happen. Property is a pretty interesting idea, and pure private property does some interesting stuff that. Uh, it's a little unpredictable what it's going to hap happen with it, but it's an incredibly powerful tool in the right hand. So, yeah, I, I would be in favor of selling off. I, I know that's sort of blasphemy. Experimentation within certain bands where you allow this kind of yeah, property Yeah, just sell rights? some of it off. So the problem is, what if it fails and you can never get it back? I guess, it's, I guess there's always eminent domain, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of public land. America tends to mix public and private. Look at land as the analogy, and, you know, even though originally maybe it all belonged to the, the king or something... Uh, or so I guess there was a revolution at some point. Um, but eventually, it originally all belonged to the king or to the government. A lot of it was privatized, and it seems like some people have done some good things with private land, it seems to me. It built nice houses and stuff. And it, so, some interesting things might happen with, with private, uh, privately sold spectrum. And I, unpredictably interesting. So I'm in favor. Interesting. Okay. Uh, second row in the middle. Derek Meyer, mobile technology consultant. Uh, two quick questions. Number one, what is your take on manufacturers such as Google paying the carriers to carry, in, the, in their case, Android phones as compared to others? And that seems to me to, to favor them over much smaller companies. And also, with most of the carriers in the U.S., with three out of the big four uh, moving toward um, LTE networks, does that does that hold at least a, a serious chance of us having one functioning combined network in this country? Yeah, the, um, you want to answer the first one. I, I, let me say the second question. Yeah, that, it's it's interesting. I, I wonder if you know. I talked earlier about the benefits of a single giant combined monopolistic network and as actually as the questioner next to you even referred to maybe you can achieve some of the economies of scale without an actual merger with the right kind of protocols uh, yeah that would be an interesting outcome I, I think that the phones of the future will certainly I mean in, in an ideal world the, the phones would just grab whatever signals the best right and, and work everything out later somehow and that's how the internet works on the backbone you just take the route that has the least traffic our phones should work the same way. And I'm, I don't know if I'm optimistic, but I hope that would be the future. Yeah. In terms of the exclusivity deals, I mean, let's face it, we all pay for those exclusivity deals. Like we have a little bit more every month that we're paying because somebody somewhere made a deal to carry the iPhone or the G phone or whatever else. And we can't opt out of it. Right, that's the crux of the problem is we pretend like we have a competitive market and people are deciding like I want to go with this market, this provider or that provider. But when they all sign exclusivity deals and we all get dinked with this hidden cost, and this also then comes back to transparency and tiering. I wouldn't be against exclusivity deals if I could opt out of it and my bill would be lower because I'm not paying that subsidy for this widget that they want to attach to my, my cell phone plan. If I could bring my own device, I, should get a, I shouldn't have to pay that premium cost for a device that I am not even using. So, again, there's a space for those kinds of deals to exist so long as consumers can opt out and not have to pay for somebody else's good or bad business decision. Very back. Hi, Troy Schneider from the New America Foundation, and uh, I just want to pass along a couple of the questions that are coming in from people who are watching the webcast. Okay. Uh, there are sort of two main threads that have popped up. One is the question of why Android and, um, and Linux-based devices haven't flourished in the way that the iPhone and seemingly the buzz around the iPad are, and whether consumers are already sort of voting with their wallets on that. And then the other question is about, uh, or more suggestion, that there's just there's a lack of perspective here and a lack of um, recognizing how much progress has been made already and not giving sort of the, the carriers uh, their fair shake in this discussion. So I just want to throw those both out there. Yeah, let, let me take on the first question. The first question is a very interesting, uh, is a very interesting one. Uh, the, the, 
the uh, Android versus g- g- iPhone battle is another iteration of the old open closed uh, battle, and um, it's a very in that respect, it's extremely interesting. The people at Android believe, as a point of religion, I think that they will win because open always beats closed. This is sort of the well, you know, the allied forces beat the Axis powers. You know, that this kind of yeah, theory, Lynch, you know. Lynch the the good guys Microsoft. always win in the right. end, even if we lose. In the, they believe this as a matter of religion uh, when, when, you, when you talk to Android people. And they are, I think you said this in one of your columns, and it's definitely right, that there's this possibility that the iPhone-Android uh, war is a little bit like Windows-Mac, which is to say the Mac was a, more attractive, more beautiful, uh, easier to use, but you know, got ultimately was crushed by Windows because Windows was more open, and, and you could basically run any application, and and the underlying uh, platform was more open. Yeah, so that might it, it's definitely the, the I think the short answer is it's too soon to too soon to tell is I think the answer, but it's very interesting because it is that exact same battle again, the same battle between open and closed that's been happening for for decades. If I can just comment a second, I, I agree we've been a little unfair to the carriers. Um, <laughs> They uh, have invested a lot of money, and uh, you know, I, to to give some credit, I do think they've there was a rigidity I think three or four years ago that has softened. I, I think three or four or five years there was this real kind of stranglehold over what people could do with phones. I, I think a- Apple needs some credit for shaking the market up with the iPhone and the App Store, which we've kind of been a little mean to. Uh, but, you know, someone's got to hold the line and. And you know, if we if we all say, "Oh, everything's great," then then nothing ever really gets better. It's a problem. Um, one thing on the on the um, Android iPhone battle, I do think that it's similar to the Windows Mac battle, but um, I think there are some key differences. First, so so one of the reasons that that Windows did really well was because it it was sort of built on this um, network effects model, where you know there were more developers willing to create um, programs for Windows. Uh, because it ran on multiple, multiple, many different kinds of hardware, which allowed the um, computers to be cheaper, and because there were more developers, there were so there were more apps, and that allowed there to be more customers, and because there were more customers, there were more developers. So it was this very um, fortunate circle for for Microsoft. Um, I think that network effects um, are less important these days because we have the web. So I think that um, so f- first of all, uh, you know, you can create an app. Um, and because apps run anywhere now, you can create a website. You know, uh, it doesn't really matter what device you have. Pretty much everything runs on everything now. Um, and in fact, the 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 um, the one device that is doing really well is the iPhone, which is closed. So you know, and doing really well in terms of native apps um, is the iPhone, which is not an open model. Um, the other thing is. Um, so, so you could say that closed might might be better this time. It might win because uh, we don't really have imp- network effects aren't that important. Um, but also, you could you, c- you it we can define winning in different ways. I mean, Android could have really huge market share, um, but not do really well in the marketplace. Like, it not, they might just not have very high profits. Um, so the way the way that the Mac Windows battle shaped up was that Windows has huge market share, um, but the last time. I checked, Apple had something like 30 or 40 percent of the profits in the PC industry, so um, in the desktop market. Um, so you know you could you could say that they both win. Um, Apple gets a lot of money, uh, Windows get a lo- gets a lot of market share. That could happen with Android and uh, and the iPhone too. So we've got about three minutes left. I want to take um, uh, Let me just quickly, very quickly. Say you know when, when asked like why aren't open devices winning, I would say they're they're cleaning house. We quickly forget that. The core, the kernel of the iPhone is a BSD operating system, which is an open source system. And so at its heart, it's wrapped in this proprietary wrapper, but at its heart, it is an open technology. It's just that it's hidden. That openness is hidden from us. Okay, okay uh, one last question in the back, uh, right there on the right. from AT&T. Yeah, he's, he's the... Rich Clark with AT&T. <laughs> I, wa- I wanted to just wait to the last so I could get a quick getaway here. But... Uh, uh, Sasha, in particular, you've been pointing uh, to Japan as being the uh, country that you think is a real leader in the quality of their uh, mobile services, the innovativeness of their applications and devices and things like this. 
However, Japan is a country which has only three major mobile carriers, the largest which, Docomo, has got 56% of the market. Uh, all of the applications are sold by the carriers. They're, they're locked particularly to the carriers. The devices are almost always bundled and sold on a locked basis with their carriers. And they tend not to work. They have specific technologies that generally are not built to uh, larger worldwide standards. So I, I guess my question here is, what does that say about what we should be trying to achieve? Which is, uh, you, think they, you think they're performing well, but they're performing well under a number of characteristics that you seem to be uh, saying aren't desirable ones. Yes. Fascinating have... question and a good one to, um, to wrap up on. So okay. uh, we're, we're, we're cutting off the mics in two minutes. So okay. Sasha, fire away. So that's a great point. And if I were in Japan talking to a Japanese audience, I'd be saying exactly the same things about that. I use Japan as a heuristic for overseas, generally speaking, but you can look at what's happening in Europe and Scandinavia and elsewhere and see that there's thriving alternative models. And I'm not saying that we just import one country's model wholesale here. I'm saying that we should be looking at things that work really well. The speeds and pricing in Japan are doing really well vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Their coverage is clearly doing much better than we are here in the United States. And so I'd like a little bit of that and then a sprinkling from, you know, some of the really open systems that we're seeing coming out of Scandinavia, for example, in terms of cell phones. I'm just saying that we should be looking around the globe for what works. I love that in India their average return per user is very low and their costs of their plans are minuscule. And I would love to see that for folks here in the United States that can't afford an iPhone and can't afford the pricing that we have here. But you're right. There's problems in every country. All right. Uh Two, second, two sentence wrap ups from each of the panelists, and then we're going to call it a day. Uh, Tim, you want to start with uh, any, well, any yeah, last just, point uh, you want to make? Uh, let's go back to the I, I just the broad perspective is what I find the most interesting, and I think we're in a, as I said, a, a long cycle. Where we're, and what you should watch in the battle between Apple and Google, which is fascinating because they were you know closest friends three years ago, is our future, and not just our future for geeks, but our future as tool-using creatures. Humans are defined by the fact that we use tools. And what are our big tools? Here they are right here in, like, the computer. That's it, right? Like, you know, 100 years ago was an axe or something. And if there was a battle over axe standards, that would matter. <laughs> These are us. This is how we're going to live. Whether it's we spend our face in front of a television or an iPad or a computer or a piano, that's who we are and how we live. And so th these things matter. Uh, Sasha? Okay, sure. Do you want to be a, can you try to be a little broader than Tim? <laughs> a little broader than Tim. Well, actually, I would point out to, you know, the, the hopeless op optimism that I they hold in, in my heart. And by that, I mean that, you know, there is an opportunity here for regulators, for the AT&Ts of the world to really create a innovative, blossoming, utopian kind of outcome from all of this. And Clearly, things are aligned with the administration, with the National Broadband Plan and the FCC, with people paying attention to issues that were only in the geekosphere mere months ago. Uh, there's an alignment that could happen where instead of fighting battles, we're actually fighting to, to push the envelope. All right. Farhad, spokesman for the geekosphere. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess I just want to say that I, we've we've sort of been negative in this panel, but I am pretty optimistic, and I think that I'm optimistic mostly because we have a new and better FCC. Um, and you know, every time one a, a cell phone company does something that I don't like, um, recently in several months, uh, I've seen the FCC respond, and it's a great thing. Um, I don't know if we'll get all of the good things that are promised in the broadband plan or that Sasha wants, but I think that it, we have a better chance that, of that now than we did a year or two years ago. All right, great. Thank, uh, thank you very much for all those fantastic questions. Covered a lot of ground. Thank you for coming. Thank you to New America. Thank you to Tim, Sasha, and Farhad. Thanks.